And so this evening, we have a, a real pleasure to receive Nicolas Mario. He's an historian and a, direct, uh, a director of research at the CNRS, the, uh, the, the National Center, and the trajectories of the Shoah and the Histoire Collective de la Shoah. It's, it's a discipline which uh, it, uh, it, he studies the past with sociological tools. Nicola Maria has also worked on the history and epi epi epistemology of the social sciences. It's important to keep that in mind because this evening Nicola is going to talk, uh, talk to us as an historian, but also as an uh, epistemologist. And beyond the, the, uh, the, the knowledge generated by the social sciences, also he also is interested in the methods for doing research. In last March, when we commemorated 25 uh, years of the genocide in Rwanda, uh, 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 of the Tutsis in Rwanda, the Maison des Sciences de l'Homme and Crash organized a, a symposium on the extreme violence in Syria, in Rwanda, and in the Central African Republic. Oh, in the Congo, sorry. And uh, Nicola had the difficult task of doing a summing up of the various presentations uh, that were made during the day. And he clarified each of the projects uh, by talking about the gain of knowledge on the topic of genocide and on the second hand, the methods for research used. And we understood that all researchers uh, of the symposium day on Rwanda uh, we're, we're in a current which we can be called situational and which is goes against another school which is called the culturalist. And this led us to, to talk about the theme of the conference this evening. Uh, there's a fairly strong controversy between these two schools of thought mo used in the studies and, these, and the investigations concerning mass violence in the 20th century. And the question that is, has to be begged as is, why does an ordinary person become a killer? On the one hand, you have the culturalist approach. And according to this approach, the, the motives of the killers are grounded in a culture of hate, hatred, that, which is why we use the word culturalism. Uh, Anti-Semitism, eth eth ethnicity, or by homophobia, etc., that kind of thing. And on the other hand, you have the other approach called situational. Now, why we call it that? It's an approach which is interested in the, the, the folding out of the massacres in, at a precise moment in time. And it highlights the political uh, rationales, that is the interests which are against one another uh, on a local level. And he also highlights the, the, the group effects that is pressure by the peers, by the elites, above all, uh, local so solidarity or family solidarity. In his work, <clears throat> never exaggerates these two approaches. The situational approach does, does not deny the role of passion in all this, but that is not the primary uh, objective of the study. The, the topic of extreme violence is a very difficult topic to tackle. And at the crash, it seemed interesting to us and useful to us to, to, to tackle it for the, the research methods that are used by the researchers. Now, why are they uh, useful? Because in the analysis of context, to have, uh, to have to keep in mind these two kinds of explanations uh, that enables us to be able to see when certain journalists or politicians uh, find in the culturalist explanation a, a scientific uh, license uh, that is a vision of the world which reduces the mass violence to conflicts which are only in, uh, in a certain situation. And so without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Nicolas, and he has 45 minutes to present his, exposition, his uh, pr presentation. And at the end, we'll be able to ask questions and have answers. So, Nicola, it's you. It's up to you. Thank you to the organizer for, for having invited uh, invited me this evening. I'm very happy about that. It's not usual for me to uh, to, uh, to to speak before people who are not students or other researchers.
And so, and, uh, because, and I hope I'm not going to be too uh, scho scholastic about this, hey, don't hesitate to tell me if I'm becoming too much of a lecturer. Don't hesitate to raise the, the idea. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me, to ask me to simplify if I can. Uh, I want to start with the commenting the the title of my my presentation, which isn't mine, but it's good. Uh, faced with the mass violence, what is the uh, what are possible solutions? I first point. I'm going to talk about a truism, but, but it's kind of self-evident. But I think we have to remember that when we claim to, that we do research in social sciences. It, it, the data never speak on their own. There is never a description without interpretation. You could even say that what is, is specific, which singularizes research work in relation to other kinds of work in the field, which, mobilize, which uses em, empirical information by the researchers. For example, in certain contemporary fields, the social science researchers are going to be in the field with journalists and possibly with uh, administrative representatives of the state, of foreign states as well, and humanitarian workers, inevitably. A lot of people who uh, generate uh, knowledge uh, from empirical information, observations, and data gathering. And they do interviews, and these pass around questionnaires, etc. And so you have exactly the same kind of data which are, which are gathered. And what I mean by that, is the, what singularizes the, uh, the 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 data gathering and research is not the empirical side, the empirical aspect, because it's shared by other professionals. But if it's a matter of saying that how people are living, or what happened at such and such a, a, a place uh, and at such and such a time in the 20th century, there are a lot of people who are as skilled as researchers in social sciences to be able to say that, how people are living or what happened at this place at this time. And sometimes there are people who do it much better than we do. A lot of people will consider, for example, that uh, uh, Florence Obna uh, uh, writes articles in, in the Monde, which are quality of writing, which are much better written than most of the, of the literature in social sciences. And in my opinion, I don't, uh, I don't think people are wrong to consider her like that. And so generally speaking, the, the work of observation in the field and the empirical work and the accounts which are produced uh, are not distinctive from the, the social sciences. So what, what characterizes the social science research? The fact of, of, uh, of assigning, assigning oneself a research problem from a given po uh, place and from that to build uh, working hypotheses to try to, to make a demonstration and to resolve a research problem. There were cases of, of, uh, of uh, various aspects of it in literature, like the uh, Chambord and other uh, classical sociologists. And uh, they're written many times. The scientific fact is, 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 is one against, the, uh, against common sense. It's built through hypotheses. And only in the end, in third place, it is observed empirically or verified empirically. And so that is the final step after the operations of construction and uh, uh, article research. And the historians are, are always much more simple than the uh, soci sociologists. I, I quote Antoine Pro. It says, there's no facts without questions. Or Paul Venn, another historian, in, in his lessons in the Collège de France, he says, materially speaking, history is written with the facts, formally with the problematic and concepts. And so it's not saying anything more than that. My thesis director always told me that It's not. It's. It's. It's not the. It's. It's not the box which makes the object, but it's the. It's the object which makes the box, and then we have to go to find the the, the boxes of uh, figures of information to be able to uh, treat the information that, that we have at our uh, disposal, and. Uh, so data never speak on their own. They have to be interpreted or to make them speak. Uh, 
data and never speak on their own. You have a magnificent example through a, a, a famous controversy in terms of mass violence and which completely redefined the the histor the history writing since the end of the 20th century is the controversy between Christopher Browning and Daniel Goldhagen. A controversy. Uh, do, do these na names mean anything to you? So I'll explain a little bit. These are two historians. In 1992, Christopher Browning, an American historian specialist in the history of the of the apocalypse, uh, published a, a book which I heartily recommend, which has been translated into French as well. These are called these ordinary men. The the t the tenth battalion of police in uh, occupied Poland uh, by the Nazis. So these are called ordinary men. So he analyzed the trajectory of a, a, a battalion of reservist policemen, uh, mature men. There was five hundred of them. They were married. They have children. They were lucky enough to be able to get, not have to fight on the e the Eastern Front. And they all they were there to the, to maintain order in occupied Poland. It was, uh, and they were socialized before Nazism. They knew the Weimar uh, Weimar Republic, and so these are not young men. They were completely socialized during. Uh, they, so it wasn't just Nazism. They were not selected uh, for for their motivation for the propaganda. They don't they don't undergo any particular propaganda. The battalion was completely renewed in the spring of 1942, and in July, uh, uh, they, all these men were brought together in April of 1942. And not at all specialists in policing, and these were not uh, uh, highly motivated people, and. and they, these, they were, these were not special groups which were meant to eliminate the Jews. No, behind the Wehrmacht, they were just uh, ordinary cops. Uh, and they, they, they were assembled in April 1942. In July, they were sent to the general government in occupied Poland by the Nazis. And 15 days later, their arrival, very brutally, one morning, the, their leader, who was called Trapp, he was an old, he was about 50, uh, over 50 years old, this trap. And he began crying and he, and he said, according to the uh, eyewitness accounts that, that were recorded afterwards, and he said to them, we're going to have to carry out an absolutely atrocious uh, task. And now we are, there are more than a thousand Jews, uh, men, women, and children uh, uh, combined. Those who don't want to do this, who do not want to carry out this atrocious task, you have the right, uh, but you have to get out of the ranks. Of the 500 people, only 12 will, uh, will step out of the ranks. And after that, Browning told the story of this battalion, which is going to remain a year and a half uh, on site in the general government and be responsible for uh, the shooting uh, in, in ditches of 38,000 men, women, and children and the sending of 45,000 people being deported to the Treblinka, where they were also put to death. You can see an extremely heavy uh, bottom line for these men. And Browning was trying to understand how a, an ordinary person can suddenly tr become a mass killer uh, for a year and a half. And then after that, so, sort of uh, 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 between quotes, come back, uh, return to normal life, so-called so normal life in uh, the post-war Germany. Since, since almost all these men are going to, would return to Germany and resume a normal life. And, all, and we know all of that because there was a, 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 an investigation carried out in, uh, for 10 years between 1960 and 1970 by a prosecutor in Hamburg who made a very serious investigation in a, in a, and to lead these people before the courts where they were sentenced to de derisory sentences, where they received uh, absolutely absurd uh, sentences of just a few years. 
And so the, I'm telling you all this be, to give you an, uh, to place the context between uh, between Browning and Goldhagen, as it the way so he, Browning made his investigation, and he interpreted the facts and and interrogated his sources, the ex post sources, the questioning of these uh, policemen before the justice system twenty years after the facts themselves. So there were very few contemporary sources from the time itself. I'll come back to that later. And so what's important here, it's a, it's a very famous controversy because Browning published the book in 1992, four years afterwards in 1996, a young American, uh, Daniel Goldhagen, wrote a thesis in science, science uh, uh, political science uh, at Harvard and is published here in France under Soit. And it was called The Willing Executioners of Hitler. And I'm not sure, I don't think, I, I can't remember the subtitle, but you can also have it in French. What is extremely interesting, it's a, it's a very ca rare case in historical writing, is the fact that the two historians work exactly on the same data, with the same data, that is the, the fundamental data that they had, the, the judicial investigation carried out in Germany in the, in the 60s and the early 70s, and they use exactly the same documentary material. Nothing additional, nothing different, nothing less than what every, the, the, each other had. And yet they arrive at completely opposing conclusions to simplify this. I probably oversimplify a little here to explain. But Browning said that there's a major role played by the effect of group of con conformity and the pressure by peers in the fact that the, most of these men had, ex had accepted become mass murderers. And you can see to what degree, uh, you saw how horrible it was. And Goldhagen said four years afterwards, he said, not at all. Uh, he said that Browning, Browning uh, com uh, com uh, was completely wrong, according to Goldhagen. And he completely missed the fact that these men were ordinary Germans. Uh, and not just ordinary men, but they were ordinary Germans. And Goldhagen said that they were ordinary Germans, meaning Germans who were profoundly penetrated by basic anti-Semitism and uh, negationist uh, in the German society even before the arrival of Hitler to power. And Goldhagen responded uh, or said that with the arrival of Hitler to power uh, made it possible for this anti-Semitism which was already inherent, uh, that is wanting the, uh, the death of the Jews, and it, it gave them free reign. And he wanted it, and he, they wanted it, and from the moment that the state gave them free reign to do it, uh, and in contrast, even encouraged this situation, uh, almost none of them refused to do it. And that's how, why you have to explain the extremely low, uh, the slow rate of the refusal by the 500, and that the immense, immense majority of these policemen had accepted to participate, sometimes with, with a certain disgust, perhaps, but this mass murder of men, women, and children, and elderly as well. So as you can see, this controversy is fundamental. It left tra uh, traces. Of thousands of pages had been written in reaction. People had commented on it, who was right and why, etc. So I, I, am not, I can't go into detail about it here because it's just too long. But I can send you an, an exhaustive bibliography if you so wish. But what's important here uh, what you have to keep in mind is the, is the question this, this poses. Is it serious that, uh, starting from the same data, that they arrive at different results? You could say, yes, it's serious. Uh, that, uh, so, that means that social, si the, uh, social sciences or, or, or anything, we have to arrive at uh, robu robust, uh, robust uh, uh, results. Whereas uh, only four years after the first, uh, the first work, the second one comes out saying exactly the opposite. W what this shows, it seems to me, and this is what I want to say by beginning my presentation today, is the fact that in social sciences, all depends on the questions that are asked and the way they are asked. And it depends on the theoretical glasses, by the way that we look at things. And we never, uh, uh, we never observe without these uh, knowledgeable glasses, so-called. And you have... 
and some people proposed a, a neutral uh, uh, glance on things. There's, uh, on facts of this order, it's absolutely impossible to bring a neutral. Now, from the moment when we are led to to process the motivations and the and the beliefs and what they had in mind at the time, necessarily the description cannot be a neutral description. We can describe facts. Uh, about who was killed on such such a day and in such and such a place, or, and such and such were present, etc. That's fine. Those are facts, and we can agree on that. And even then, there's a little bit of a wobble. But from the moment when it's a matter of interpreting the behavior of people, which we uh, which we always end up by doing at one moment or another, and then why they did that. We are carrying with us, uh, we're conveying epistemology, etc., which, and you're going to see that these are things which are very real. For example, if you read Browning's book and Goldhagen's book, you're going to be struck by their different ways of describing history. And it's not nothing that Browning wrote a, hist uh, uh, a history which what I would qualify as an account by reputation. He describes the history of a group in which each, each person, each individual policeman uh, has a reputation in relation to the other people and there's interactions between them about what's going on. And he follows, this is the story, the, 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 the getting trapped into violence, massacre after massacre, and strictly chronologically, from the beginning to the end, where he tries to show to, uh, to at what pace uh, where people uh, uh, stepped over the line, uh, etc. It's an account which can be said with, ethnogra with a historical material, we can say that it's an ethnographic uh, account, which resembles uh, accounts made by anthropologists. Uh, but Goldhagen's uh, account is sensibly, se sensibly different. It resembles more a, a classical historian's uh, a, 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 a big overall picture, where Goldhagen is going to take from the material everything that he's interested in. But he's going to uh, write an account, is going to try to put in relation the culture of anti-Semitism and the men themselves and the policemen and their beliefs. But between the beliefs and the, and the depictions of the world or the, imagine, the, the, the imagination, you read that about in mass violence. We're always talking about these things. Uh, to reconstitute means the, the quest for the, the imaginations of the people and their depictions of the world, their, their beliefs, etc. And between this imaginary life and the individuals, there's nothing. There are no longer any social groups. There's no uh, anteriority. There's no association between them. There's nothing. You have individuals uh, on one level, and then you have the culture above them. And it, it, we, what we have to know is what is pl playing between culture and them. So it's the kind of a story and a historical account which is uh, where Goldhagen is going to pick uh, examples, and, and it's uh, an account of uh, uh, that are done by many historians. It's exactly when we do accounts of uh, with witnesses, for example, and then they're going to cut uh, and they're going to use cutouts, and, and the whole issue here is how they cut cut them up. Are we going to repeat what the, uh, are we going to relate what the, t uh, the witnesses say and they talk about their social origins, etc.? What Goldhagen is interested in is not the, the witness himself, it's, exa it's only what he says. And so then he, bring, he puts together these little uh, f uh, phrase endings to reconstitute the, the moral background and the, the anti-Semitic background of these men. And that's what motivated him, and that was his approach, to, and that's why And he then tried to explain why they behaved the way they did. Now, from that, you've understood that the controversy between Browning and Goldhagen uh, 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 underlined, stressed the two uh, opposing schools and the two major ways of considering things. And so the social sciences, the approach called uh, culturalist or dispositionalist, uh, 
which are going to going to talk about the disposition of these people, talking about these individuals in terms of their socialization. In other words, we explain what they do and what they do with their life at any given moment in relation to the way in which they have been socialized. What they, what they, what they believe in? What are their motives? Uh, what's their vision of the world and how they r arrive at their choices and their decisions? It's individu individualistic, which feels that people always implement uh, f uh, the autonomy of their will. They are uh, have free will. They are able to make choices. In the Anglo-Saxon literature, there's a theme which is, is long-lasting, which you often read in... You talk about agency, the ability to act. And many of these researchers considered that the, ultim the ultimate task of the researchers should be to reconstitute the, the capacity of, pe of people's capacity to act. And so reconstitute their agency. What, that, what, what they had in mind uh, as far as beliefs are concerned, what kinds of a choice did they make, and what kind of decision did they make. Once that has been reconstituted, and then we're able to talk about their behavior. And you're going to see that their methods is, is a referential method about what is visible as compared to what is invisible. And so we go back to it. what is visible, and that's the behavior. That's what's visible. So we have mass violence. What is particularly visible? Cruelty. And so they are going to convey, they're going to pay a particular attention to cruelty. And through dismembered bodies, that kind of thing. And starting from that, from that, they are going to build uh, observations of cruelty, and they're going to relate them to feelings, that is, hatred. That's the first reference level. If they were as cruel, it's only because they ha had a, a steep hatred in them. And then we're going to build that up to move, to move toward their depiction of the world or their beliefs. And so you go from their behavior to the culture. And in the end, it's the culture which is then going to explain the behavior. It's a kind of a circular argument. Their, their behavior makes it possible to show about their depi cultural depictions, which then goes back to their behavior. So it's kind of a circle. And that's what I call the culturalist explanation or dispositionalist, generally to try and simplify as possible and to sum up. And this refers to the anteriority of the people themselves. What these researchers are looking for are trying to reconstitute what people have within themselves, in their minds. They, they think that, they think such and such, therefore they do such and such. And so you do the reversal thing, we see what they do, and then we try to deduct what they think, what they believe in. Uh, so this is slightly uh, uh, simplistic. Uh, but uh, but I am caricaturing a little bit here, but it's slightly simplest, simplistic, but to, I want to be as brief as possible. And so it's this behavior, which we call cultural historist, and it is opposed to another approach where we're rather going to consider that the individual behavior are, lo are broadly explainable because they're exterior to individuals much more uh, but what they have in in the, in the, inside them and in their minds, and this refers to this is what Browning does. Ordinary people placed in a situation, uh, placed in an extraordinary situation, which 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 uh, which bypasses them completely, goes way beyond what they're, and they get involved in it, stuck in it. These factors, call, known as situational, because it, it refers to the situ exterior situation in which each of these individuals are, are plunged, and they, they refer to a certain number of factors. The first is brutality, the inherent brutality linked to war, that is the, the, the savagery of the war itself. And also, there's more general, uh, and it's even more, and even savagery, savagery is even more if in, in civil war, for example. 
and you have just the normal, uh, the, the the normalization of the dirty work that has to be done, like somebody works in a, a slaughterhouse, for example, to be able to make the comparisons between the private life and to they see the job as they see it as dirty work and there's all work of segmentation they have preci precise roles and each you go from one function to the next with as limited a passage as possible to, to, from the worst possible scenarios what we engage people by having make them participate in a a, a dragnet uh, of victims we don't ask them to kill and then we accompany the people to the edge of the ditch and in the end, they say this is the moment, and that's when you take the weapon and you shoot. And so it's a so it is a gradual process, and you, a lot of work has described that, especially in the apocalypse, but also in many other cases as well, uh, along the same lines. Another kind of situational thing: the selection of the of the killers, their ideological training, the potential role of uh, of their careers and also deference to authority. And here we come to the support and the theses, uh, the situationist theses, uh, they refer back to a, a lot of investigations of psychosociological in the 50s and the 60s, in which cases, in, in tests which we can no longer do it today uh, because of uh, ethical problems uh, today, but you have probably heard the uh, talk about them, the, the milligrams uh, about, the, about the, the subservience to authority, for example. Or uh, do you know the experiment by uh, milligram? And so you, uh, uh, the Solomon Ash on social conformity, it's a little less known, but well, I will sum it up very quickly. We put people in a room who and they're playing a role, they all, uh, they are pre-prepared roles, and the topic of the experiment is introduced, and then we, we draw lines on a, a blackboard. There are about five are the same length, and a sixth one, which is twice as long as the other five. And then you ask people to say orally, what is the longest line? And they all agree in saying it's one of the five small ones. They don't show the big one, which obviously is longer. And we then observe, uh, the, but very often the, the 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 subject in the in the group is is going to agree with the group against all evidence. He's going to say, like the group, I agree with the others that it's in fact one of the five short lines. Whereas very clearly he sees it, and he sees he knows it's not the longest line. It's a very uh, it, it's a it's a it's a famous uh, experiment for showing how peer pressure group uh, how the pressure by peers can influence the people. There's also the Stanford test where we put people in a room, we choose students, and half of them we are. are are, are prison wardens, and the other half play uh, the role of prisoner. So I'm not going to go. It, so there's this this experiment has been challenged, but they, they, they we observe very quickly those who are the wardens. Uh, they, they 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 embrace their role so much that in fact they start beating the uh, the so-called uh, prisoners. And this happens very quickly uh, in adapting a role, which they are asked to do, and they're asked to play uh, more, real, uh, uh, more real than nature. And, so, and after a week, they had to stop the experiment because the, the so-called wardens became so violent toward the prisoners that they had to stop the experiment after a week. And uh, the prisoners were falling in depression, etc. And it didn't, it really didn't go very well at all. That was in the early 1950s. And all these experiments were Milligram and Solomon Hash were the, uh, from Jewish ancestry, uh, people who had migrated to the United States and for whom 
obedience and obeying the authority is a great concern. Solomon Hash uh, carried out his experiment in the early 50s milligram in 1961. That is almost at the same time as Eichmann's trial. Milgram started his experiment when the uh, Hilberg uh, book on the destruction of the Jews of Europe was published. I think it was 1961 or 1962, I don't remember exactly. And at the same time, the Eichmann trial and Hannah Arendt report on the trial and the uh, a way to consider things which is uh, very far from uh, our today's insight on uh, the situation, on focusing on beliefs and anti-Semitism and other things, uh, while uh, focusing on a peer pressure situational aspect that did play a key role. And the other experiment uh, was made in 1968, 1969, I think. That's uh, when his results were published in the early 70s. So that's roughly the opposition between these two types of explanations. And they seem to be impossible to reconcile. But I think that one of the challenges of today's uh, work of historian is to try and see how we can see together the structure and the individual or the individual and the structure rather than setting in marble this uh, Gold Goldhagen Browning controversy while bearing in mind that it is important to remember that paradoxically Goldhagen, so the second author, the one who uh, published uh, this book in 1996, that is uh, the Hitler's willing execution year, was a bestseller in the United States and Germany, and not so much in France and Israel for in for reasons that would be interesting to look at. Oberbachtov has um, written a very interesting report on how Goldhagen's book was received by various uh, readers and audiences. But he was criticized, Goldhagen was criticized heavily by other historians who said, your vision is uh, oversimplistic. You identify only one cause. Your history about anti-Semitism doesn't hold. The German society was not like that before. Uh, the Nazis uh, took power and even before. And he came with the opposite argument and said that not all the um, uh, executioners were not Germans and not all the victims were Jews, and which is true to a certain extent. Nevertheless, Browning's book was uh, published in 1996. No, Goldhagen, Goldhagen's book, says the speaker, I'm sorry. So Goldhagen's book uh, was published in 1996. This proves that people paying attention to what I said. So it was immediately translated in French and German and was published at the same time as a huge exhibition which started in Hamburg and which traveled in uh, Germany for five years. Uh, which an exhibition which gathered more than 800 viewers because it was an exhibition on the role of Wehrmacht, that is the German army, in uh, the killing of people in Eastern Europe. We're talking about 18 million uh, Germans who were uh, mobilized in the German army in Wehrmacht and who were supposed to, the, ar the German army was supposed to be quote unquote clean. You know, there were not the SS, there were not the Einsatzgruppen. It was an institution that behaved properly under the Nazi regime. But that is not the case at all, as was demonstrated quite clearly by this, uh, the, this exhibition with many uh, uh, pictures, etc. And Goldhagen published the book at the same time, uh, toured in Europe to promote his book. And it was exactly at the time as the exhibition. So. And his book uh, sold uh, just like hotcakes. It was a bestseller. And he was heavily criticized by all historians over the world. But gradually, what 
remained from this controversy and these discussions and debate. And Goldhagen is quite a, a perseverant guy who replied and replied and replied to each and every criticism. And one of his great quality is that he describes uh, his working methods and all the material he's used. So it's very interesting to uh, open up the debate. So beyond all the criticisms from historians, ultimately what was said after years and years of uh, harsh controversies in the early 2000s, Goldhagen was right on one point he raised against the issue of anti-Semitisms and beliefs at the heart of the history of Shoah, which was kind of uh, set aside after the controversy between functionalist and intentionalist, that is the important controversy between German historians in the early 1980s, where the idea was rather, should we explain this basically because of uh, Hitler's intentions and uh, uh, Hitler's uh, command intentions, uh, so, or is it because of the structure of the regime and the initiatives which were made and the steps which were made in the field by the Nazis who were sent out east and who wanted to work? As a very suggestive uh, Ian Kershaw said, uh, they wanted to work to show the Fuhrer uh, the Führer, that uh, they wanted to uh, pledge allegiance to him, you know, to uh, show that uh, uh, they had some dignity in performing this work. And they took these local initiatives in of killing Jews, which was taken up by uh, people after the first massacres. And then the corporate level, so to speak, in Berlin said, you're right, let's carry on. So it's a kind of gear that started. Uh, so from the bottom, to serve and pledge allegiance to the Führer, which was then taken up, or it was a kind of mixture of some patchy initiatives here and there, which resulted in actual murders, which were then taken up by the center, by the central power. So it was something that uh, set aside the outskirt, in the outskirts this question of beliefs or faith or anti-Semitism and said that it was mainly local decisions of people who were hoping that they would be promoting because uh, they were serving the regime. It was a weird uh, kind of uh, regime uh, with a polycentrism as opposed to what is highlighted today, um, the utopia regarding Eastern Europe and the creation of the Volksgemeinschaft, that is the community of the Nazi people. It's about uh, talking seriously about uh, the uh, Nazi statements as a system to justify beliefs which could help us to understand this uh, uh, tremendous and horrible tilting in mass killings and mass violence. Uh, and some German historians today working in the United States, like Kuhne, who've uh, explained that the Volksgemeinschaft, the Nazi community, uh, emerged, was shaped by performing the genocide and by being directly emerged in the genocide, directly or indirectly as accomplices. This is why a lot of work has been done more recently about the role of women, not only the role of men, uh, women as supporters of this process. Uh, but I'm drifting away from the main focus of my uh, talk. And I'll go back to my papers, otherwise I'll be uh, drifting apart too much. So in this uh, scheme, so to speak, in this pattern, so we'll set aside the situation uh, focus. Uh, 
and uh, we're going to go towards uh, gold Hagen is more hem hegemonic today, so to speak. But the aftermath of his work is that it has resulted in many other investigations about uh, beliefs, the representation of the Nazi world, the so-called idea of a moral na uh, Nazi as opposed to Browning's work. Now, put it in simple world, uh, Browning's book is still being quoted, but it didn't result in many investigations trying to explain what he uh, described and try to see whether what he uh, said was right uh, uh, in this uh, 100th uh, police. But I also wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, It's not only uh, something that applies to Shoah or the Second World War. The same type of investigation and the same type of proposal was made regarding the First World War. And I will refer it to a single world, which is uh, the counterpart of that of Goldhagen. Stéphane Audouin Rousseau and Annette Baker's book, a very interesting book published in the year 2000 entitled 1418, uh, um, Rediscovering the First World War. Retrouver la guerre in French. It's also a, a paperback in France. And they said, no, let's forget. What they said is that let's forget everything that has been written by historians about it because we didn't take into account the uh, individual cases. That is, there is a kind of a, 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 a septic vision of what happened during the First World War. So far, historians have uh, produced a very flat a very dull description of what was mass violence during the First World War or during Shoah. And in both instances, and this was uh, translated in this emphasis on a so-called industrial death. In the Second World War extermination camps, Goldhagen said, we've put too much focus on this Auschwitz-Birkenau paradigm and the other uh, camps, uh, Treblinka and others, without considering the shootings next to the ditches in the Soviet Union. And that was due to the Berlin Wall and the fact that many archives which had been kept in Moscow were found after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was impossible before 1989 to go to uh, Soviet Union. And that's also uh, what happened in ex-Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, and uh, the Tutsi genocide in Rwanda, where here again, there were face-to-face -face killings, uh, which are raising the question of this direct uh, killing and not the mass or industrial killings in uh, gas chambers in extermination camp or what happened during the First World War. What Antoine Rousseau and Becker said is that we've put too much emphasis on the artillery mass killing, which was key during the First World War. Some up to 90% of the, those killed or injured in the First World War were killed by shells, by the artillery or by uh, machine guns, etc. And Audouin Rouson and Annette Becker said, well, no, we should also talk about uh, the uh, uh, fights in the ditches, in the trenches with uh, knives, you know, and all these types of uh, uh, weapons that he could have because this is when they realized that it was a face-to-face -face, uh, fight, uh, men fighting with men. Uh, so that, and it is only uh, through the analysis of this type of fights that we can understand what people had in their mind. In the artillery, they were not on the front lines. You know, uh, they could shoot at long range, and they wouldn't see the damage that they were causing and the mass casualties caused by their shootings. So it was far easier for them. 
Same thing with drones today, uh, with the uh, guy who presses on the button and who is uh, who is a you know push button in the United States and uh, controls the drones uh, that kills people in Iraq. So the killer no longer holds any responsibility for his crimes because he's far away from the victims. What Goldhagen said and Becker and Antoine Rousseau have said is that uh, if we only focus on these mass killers, we do not understand what are the beliefs of the killers to understand the representation and the war imagination they have. Uh, we have to uh, delve into these uh, fights between men when the men would uh, climb up the trenches and uh, would uh, attack uh, the trenches of the enemies with a face-to-face -face fights. Of course, it's not uh, reported uh, by Goldhagen, but by Audouard Rousin and uh, Becker, it's only marginal, I would say. It's less than 1% of the injuries which were called uh, caused and perpetrated with uh, knives during the uh, First World War. So it raises many questions as, as to their demonstration uh, because these were uh, minority actions in the uh, Great War uh, fights, but they did exa exactly that Goldhagen did. They took uh, these examples of uh, uh, direct fighting and uh, then took some distance and consider uh, the uh, greater perspective. You know, there were all this history of hand cuts by Germans when they uh, went through Belgium. There's a wonderful uh, work by John Hoare and Alan Kramer called The German Atrocities to uh, Irish historians who talked about uh, the impact of this uh, crimes perpetrated by Germans. So it helped and fostered a kind of war culture which impregnated uh, the minds of uh, each and every one on all sides of the front, which could account for this um, ascent to the war, to assenting the war. That is that people, even more than that, they would consent uh, the war. They're not uh, obliged to it. It's not because there's no other way. It's just they accept, they consent uh, the war because it's the culture of that time, you know, which is made of passion and kind of intellectual constructions, which are more always true. It's the same thing with the Tutsi genocide. And this is what we need to reconstruct to try and understand what they did and why they did it at this particular moment. Shall I stop here? Yeah, I know I'm very talkative, says the uh, lecture. And I'll try to come to a conclusion and I'm gonna say many, many different things, but I'm sorry, I won't have the time to say it all. There's just one thing which is very interesting that I should uh, talk about. Well, I think it's very interesting in relation to what I said about uh, the almost hegemonic explanation based on the war imagination, war culture, beliefs, etc. The research which has been uh, carried out by young researchers who've uh, produced their PhD thesis in Rwanda on the Tutsi genocide. More recently, therefore, are very interesting because it's the opposite perspective and their approach is more situational and consider genocide like a, a shift, a, a, a switch um, with this idea that ethnic hatred is not the only driver, the only explanation to uh, uh, the genocide for many different reasons that are interesting, uh, such as that, as you know, the genocide started abruptly after the attempt, uh, the coup against uh, the uh, presidential aircraft. And most of these researchers have noticed that uh, the violence uh, 
crime, the violent crimes didn't start everywhere at the same time. So if there was such an overwhelming hatred throughout the country, we don't understand why in some area there were spurs of violence and in other places uh, there it was far more delayed with some resistance and only started after a few days and weeks where they killed uh, the uh, resistant uh, forces to be able to be to have leeway to kill the Tutsi. So there were different approaches. And another finding is that there was not a clear cut in the southern regions of the country where people are asked. They said that even on the day where the president was killed, when they had their night shifts, these were made jointly by Hutu and Tutsis together. So how is it that in a few days, uh, just like uh, in Browning's description, almost everywhere, everywhere, ultimately, sometimes with a few days or weeks of delay, it's all switched into an extreme violence uh, which resulted in the mass killings you are familiar with. One final word I'd like to say is about the following. How is it important uh, that in this general setting, where we try to understand the war imagina imaginaries and the cultural imaginaries, which is considered as the holy grail of research. Why is it important to leave some room for the situational approach that I described? For a very basic and paramount reason, I think that the cultural history uh, approach or explanation works everywhere when you have killers with a motive. When you have uh, zealous killers where you can describe the behaviors of those people taking initiatives who are the drivers who uh, will be uh, volunteering to kill, you know, the uh, uh, approach based on each and everybody's motives and drivers is uh, perfectly acceptable. But in all uh, mass killings and in the case of genocides, and it is also the case during the First World War, the Shoah and other cases, Cambodia, for instance. We can have uh, many other examples. Mass killing or genocide features what I would call the fact that you have refractory killers. People who initially didn't have any motives, didn't want to, were not volunteering, didn't have any willingness, and who nevertheless killed other people. And they took part in the genocide and the killing. In these 500 guys I was describing from the 101 uh, police battalion, as shown by Browning, only uh, have the maximum of 20% of the uh, 500 said reservation. We don't want to kill. Now, this was expressed in different ways. Goldhagen said, well, they didn't oppose in principle. They just expressed a physical disgust. Can you make such a clear-cut division between this uh, disgust and this uh, uh, withdrawal? I, this is not my purpose here. This is not what I'm heading at here. What I'm seeing here, a maximum of 20% amongst these guys um, withdrew, and it was accepted. In the beginning, only 12, and not everybody was involved in killing in the beginning. But throughout the process, uh, they were uh, set aside from the group. They were uh, said that they were the weak guys. Uh, they uh, were the object of stigma, that they were not a good German. They were not good Nazi guys, that they were weak, that they deserved uh, being despised, etc. But nothing serious happened to them. Never a German was killed for uh, refusing to kill Jews. Never a German was taken to court and jail for that. And uh, they were just the object of stigma for the worst of cases. And almost all of them did take part at one point or another. Uh, 
because their uh, higher official uh, uh, officers or command eyes them to it. And in, in Tutsi case, uh, genocide, it's the same. People who had no motives ended up killing. That's, that's the fundamental question. If there were only zealous killers, the, the, we wouldn't have to discuss it and uh, research it anymore. They might constitute a very important core of killers, but they're never the majority in the in societies we're talking about. So therefore, how is it that there will be mass killing in a given society? And in my opinion, the culturalist approach is not good enough to answer this question. We should come up with other element which will and, uh, help us to understand social conformism, peer pressure, and other factors which could explain why non-motivated people uh, became killers. And switching to mass killing supposes that people who were reluctant ended up accepting taking part in the killings. And I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry it was too long. Thank you, Nicola, uh, for this uh, introductory uh, lecture. So it was both clear and accurate describing these two modes of interpretation to try and explain mass killings i will now give the give you the floor you're invited to ask any questions you'd like to uh, psychiatrist emmanuel then we talk about the social psychology of of the reservist policemen and yet there's a there's this thing about social uh, social psychology you, you you have the dilemma of the of the volunteers we don't ask people to, to leave the group, and not those who are volunteers, but those who don't want to do it. And so the social effect is not the same. And on the other hand, what we call the engagement, meaning the, the fact uh, of, of having the feeling after the fact, of, of, of having definitely ch uh, chosen something, at the moment when it was possible to say no, those who said no, that, that those are the ones who are engaged in the action, and they find themselves to have to find a, a, a policy of justification, self-justification. So my question, and so it's very difficult to make a, a, a synthesis between the two, is it a, a cultural in the previous situations In relation to, uh, to what about uh, to Thomas Skinner, the ideology is built in action because there's a kind of a circuit between the the ideology and the action, and which leads to a narrative of hatred. And as we, in other words, putting uh, putting in accordance the uh, their their beliefs with their actions, and that's what uh, Kuhner, Skinner S. E. Fedi tried to show. It's one of the main avenues, uh, relevant avenues, to understand the effects of the effects of propaganda and ideology in the field. Not in the ba not as a background, but the problem of ideology is that we manage to re reconstruct the ideological narrative by reading newspapers, uh, watching films, whatever. But what we don't know, how they're going to uh, react to really, how it acts uh, in real terms uh, with the people. And there are some interesting things here in, in Skinner's work as a, in practice, put, how to implement that in practice in the field. And what another historian, Omar Bartov, uh, Bartov who is a specialist in the Wehrmacht in, in the Western Front, uh, is called in, in a book, in a very inter interesting book called The Army of Hitler. They, they, the Sturmer was one of the uh, uh, principal uh, propaganda organs of the Nazis. Uh, 
what, what I call the, the Sturmer effect is to see how the ideology is implemented in real terms in the field. And what Bartov does, he worked starting from the, the, the archives of the interior, uh, the personal uh, the diaries and uh, letters uh, sent by the soldiers on the front to the families. And in these letters, we see, for example, a, a mention where they describe the Soviet front uh, as being the, the disaster created by them. You know that the Wehrmacht was using the burnt earth, uh, the burnt earth uh, politics to, uh, just uh, up until Moscow. And in fact, what I saw was that it was even worse than I read in the Sturmer. That is, photo these photographs were, were completely deteriorated. The Jews were completely abandoned, and they called they smell and they uh, they are they they are like human rags. And it's worse that was even said in the Sturmer. But they were the ones who were largely responsible for this fact, that is the, the Wehrmacht, that because these people were trapped between the two fronts, between the Russians and the, and the Germans, and they couldn't leave for whatever reason. And you can see here, there is an effect of the propaganda through a mechanism of re reading the reality, and it's worse than I could ever seen before. And there were a lot of things uh, uh, of that order, and Browning showed, as you mentioned very correctly, and others, he said how the question, the issue of uh, guilt, of getting people into the circle of genocide and in the circle of mass murder, even before they participate themselves in the killing, it plays a fundamental role. And so they have a very difficult problem of getting out of that situation. And so there are a lot of uh, psychosociological studies which demonstrate uh, that one of the, the fundamental traits of human uh, uh, the personality is that when there is a difference between our be uh, beliefs and our behavior, we have a much greater uh, uh, tendency to adapt our be beliefs to our behavior uh, rather than the opposite. And it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's much easier in relation to other people. It's much more difficult individually to do that, but it's much easier to do that in, fr in front of a group. And then likewise, you have the notion of a pluralistic ignorance in the apocalypse where you had these 500 policemen. They were, they, di they ignored what, they, they, they didn't know what the others were failing, but they agreed with what the, they were offered to do. And so they adopted the situation in which they were, were put. And so you're completely right, it's toward this kind of uh, investigation that the present day work is, be, is tending to, to go to. It's more question, uh, 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 is another uh, uh, response is rather to see culture as a long-term effect of the situation, meaning that the, the Germans were ordinary because they were p placed in a system uh, for years, and so they were socialized by the system itself. Perhaps you mean the Nazi system? No, the system, the social, the social system, the, cult, the general German culture. And the situationist uh, point of view would be what is happening on a scale of society in extreme situations more, more, more suddenly and in a, more co in a coercive manner than they could uh, uh, in the way that uh, a person is socialized throughout, uh, throughout their lives. With the problem with that, you're going to be immediately facing with the, the reconstruction of culture and society as if the German society before the Second World War was composed of social atoms which are strictly identical one, from the, one with the other. Uh, which were imposed on by an omniscient uh, culture, and it makes people uh, react in the same way. But I don't think so. That's one of the major dangers of the culturalist explanation, is to make people totally sub uh, subjected to, to uh, manipulation by the culture. 
And it's very difficult to demonstrate that. Uh, I would say even impossible. It's especially, especially in uh, modern societies like, our, uh, like ours uh, today. There's uh, strong differences be between societies in the functions, the professions, and the kinds of... If you have a, an hypothesis which is as culturalist as this, that means you no longer leave a place of the differences between social groups. There's no longer any social classes. And that's what we tried, that's what uh, de Maizy tried to do, that is create a, a sort of Volksmannschaft, uh, that is, to, that de denies the social differences. They see that there, you no longer have any laborers or bosses or anything like that. You have only one uh, German people you, uh, you, uh, unified in blood. And that's what the Nazi, Nazis tried to do. They tried to promote that, and it worked to, to a degree. But the idea is to see to how far it can go. Uh, in the sense, is the idea here to, of building a, a Nazi morality, which would enable the Germans in the end to be able to accept the murder of Jews as something as normal, as uh, desirable? And that is, that's the tez of the, of Goldhagen. Is this hypothesis strong enough to be able to say, but it supposes what Goldhagen says, he says that you have an, a, a, deep, a deeply rooted anti-Semitism cultivated over the years, ever since 1910, that, uh, that, uh, that englobed all of the German society. And so what do you do with that, with the integration of the Jewish communities in the German society in, before, the, the, before the 20th century? Or uh, uh, in contrast, uh, where you have the Jewish communities were the, one of the most assimilated uh, in all of Europe by far. And you have the positions, the, you have, it's very difficult to be, to consider the idea that there was a, a, a negationist uh, anti-Semitism which completely invaded uh, German society, considering the, the situation of the Jewish uh, community within uh, the pre-Nazi Germany. And it's, it's, it's very easy to opt for a decision, uh, assuming a decision, we can consider that. We consider that hypothesis. Uh, we have to take it into consideration, that's for sure. But I, I don't want to uh, make this forgotten by history, but this culturalist uh, hypo hypothesis is diff difficult to take that into consideration because it leads us to think that we can uh, change the morality from one day to the next. Not from one day to the next, but almost. And that really does pose uh, huge problems. That is, you can tip over into a Judeo-Christian society, and as we have done, which has been built up over centuries, and then suddenly, we tip over into something else, and th which was the Nazi morality, and they created a another morality, and it bore uh, it bore fruit, but it raised fundamental questions because what happened in 1945 then, and then suddenly we back up, we go backwards, it's finished, and there's no more Nazi morality in three months with the Allies winning the war, they've completely cleansed uh, Germany of the uh, of the Nazi ideology. It just simply disappeared. It's a culturalist hypothesis, and it's very interesting, granted, and it has to take it into consideration, but that it may be one thing to be able to help us to understand what went on. But, but it raises a lot of problems which are, are consequential, and one of them not being that uh, uh, to uh, de uh, uh, to uh, uh, take the responsibility away from the actors themselves. This uh, Nazi, uh, these Nazi beliefs, they believed in them so much that in fact that they were able to act on what they thought and in good faith. And that it does raise a considerable problem, at least from my point of view. I think at uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, have, uh, have for decades now are faced with extreme uh, violence, situ situations of extreme violence, uh, as, as violent as you describe here. Uh, 
And so obviously, I don't want to try, I don't want to become an advisor for MSL. But relatively suddenly, they are faced with the situation of camps filled with people after mass violence. And yet, they still have to try and understand something, and not just to react uh, and to care for people, but they have to try to understand what happened. And so they're going to hear a lot of things said by these people and also by uh, external observers. Would you advise them to say that uh, don't become uh, culturalism or situationalism? Uh, do, uh, that is, should MSF try to adopt the the situational uh, way, that is, to talk to the leaders, etc.? And perhaps the people at MSF could uh, speak about the experiences they've had uh, of this nature. But what would you advise them to, and what would you advise them, the MSF, to do? I haven't, I haven't really got any advice to be able to give, but the only thing I can say, which is simple and self-evident, for example, the, the, human, the work done by Human Rights Watch, uh, uh, by Alison Desforges, it's very simple in my opinion. The, the more we're going to do precise investigations in the field and discussing locally, with people uh, about the, 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 the local, uh, <laughs> then you know, the, culturalist, uh, the, the culturalist hypothesis is going, to, uh, is going to disappear by itself. Because what, the closer you get to the field and to the details about what happened, and in such and such a place, in such and such a city or town, uh, or in some uh, isolated area, and you're going to see, more you're going to see uh, added to this ideologies, propaganda, and uh, zealot, uh, zealous things. The more you're going, to, you're going to see local interests are going to en enter into the game, and uh, old disputes, for example, that are local, uh, ancestral hatred, for example, or local jealousies and things like that. And the more you're going to all, almost uh, automatically be led to to enter into local explanations of the violence, elements of the situation which are totally local. And it's simple, but the problem being, which Browning was faced with uh, in their work, uh, then how do we go from the local scale to a general, uh, a general account of the genocide? And that's what the book which demonstrated very well by Human Rights Watch. That is the local explanations, and then you have the more general explanations. The more you're going to have a greater t a tendency to do a lot of investigations, uh, which, are f which focus, with, for example, when we are on our own to be able to do a thesis, we can't uh, do an investigation on all of Rwanda. We're going to choose four sectors or four town townships. Uh, well chosen th throughout the country, and then we're going to work it out in depth in relation to these four uh, townships. And the more we're going to do that, what, uh, and then that, that's how we might get up to the, the more global uh, account of the genocide about with the interim government, for example. And so the whole issue here, and it's not easy, is to be able to put in relationship between these two. That is the, the, the rationale of the situation itself, which are never identical from one place to the next, to a more general account, so that we have the conveyors of the, the, gen, of the, uh, the, the, the committers of genocide and which engage uh, the administration, as in the case of the Tutsi uh, massacre, which also engages a propaganda policy and to be able to put in relationship the two is not easy to do. But what I, we have to keep both in mind. And you have to try to think of them in, 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 in tandem. The closer you get to, uh, to a local place, the more you're going to have a situation which is going to be evident, obvious. With everybody knows the reputation of, of other people, and, and eventually the victim knew the person who killed them, etc. And that was the case in Rwanda. It was also the case in a lot of other places in the apocalypse, as Browning describes. Uh, 
of this uh, battalion, these policemen uh, who came from Hamburg and uh, the Hanseatic cities, and they came together in Poland, Poland, and they are going to be among the people who have to ex execute are people who are deported from Hamburg. And they're already killed the Polish Jews in the ghetto and, and uh, liberating the ghettos to be able to make place for the deportation, deportation of, of the German uh, Jews. And then starting in 1941, uh, the German Jews uh, are deported into, into Poland. And the poli uh, one of the policemen uh, recounted to the judge this, this, th that's why this issue of dehumanization don't work very well. We have to really think about it. And this dehumanization to, to facilitate murder, one of the policemen uh, recounted uh, before, the, uh, before the courts, uh, and the, the policeman said, I had to uh, kill a woman that I recognized as being a worker in the cinema where I went in Hamburg. And I spoke in German, because they, they both spoke German, of course, to a guy who said that they explained to me that he was a, a veteran of the First World War for, for, uh, uh, from Bremen. And see, so the closer you get to the situation and of, of man to man, the, the, the more you have to undo the major uh, explanations like they were forced to by the culture itself. And uh, the, you have to ask the local questions in a local manner to be able to move up, or in my opinion, to the, uh, to the higher level and not just to sweep them aside by saying we no longer have anything to do with, uh, with the be beliefs because it doesn't make any sense to, it, to work in that manner. But to try to see how it could be implemented locally to, and justified locally and, and when and, at, and where. And when, for example, it's an issue of the of the robbing the victims of their of their goods. The first is to know what approach would be located the uh, the, the the situation of uh, child soldiers in, in situations of mass murder. And do you have any documentation on that? And also, it's, it's to consider the, you you quoted the, resp the the idea of making the, the, the making people responsible for the dropping of, of, of bombing by drones, and also those who press the button for the nuclear attacks. Obviously, with a nuclear weapon, it, it's it's obvious, and so it has been thought out. There were there. Were, there were people, the uh, bombardiers, who had dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then obviously, it's in this process, long and uh, complicated uh, situation of, uh, of making people responsible. And that is a part of it. Now, now the children, the children soldiers. Uh, it's a very good question because there's a real uh, that shows where there's a real confrontation between these two uh, approaches. Where the where the uh, dispositionalists, uh, the people, are more sensitive to propaganda, and we can when what we could uh, brainwash them with. So this is typically young people who are mobilized uh, by fervor or an ideology, etc. But, or you can say, not at all, it's just the contrary. The, the, that is, these are explanations which really don't uh, hold up very well, where we have to go to a more situational interpretation, where they were brave, they had to keep leave their families, and they had to prove their worth in battle. Now, on, on that, you have very... In you have the very interesting work by Manon Mano Pino. He, he's just brought a book on that about the the commitment by the young people and children in the wards. It, it appeared in, it was published, I think, uh, in, in 2019. I wanted to come back to one of the issues you about earlier about the, the, the massacres in Israel with the uh, slaughterhouses and uh, the, the use of, uh, of uh, knives, hand weapons. And I'm thinking about uh, about the, the the French writer Yosena, who said that there are generations that have kill, having killed uh, having killed uh, animals in in cattle wagons, and 
what, what role do you see in the conditioning that that may play on, on people who are transporting the... And so repeat the uh, quote. In, it's in relation to the distance we may be able to have in the slaughterhouses where people are there with, a high, with depression they suffer and, and, the, uh, and the high turnover it causes. I often think that if, if we have accepted that for generations that we kill animals in the cattle wagons and people who are meant to convey them can, can not, how, how can they not support, uh, put up with, tolerate the idea of uh, transporting people at the same time if they've done that with animals? So it's very difficult to be able to answer that kind of comment. Uh, what is for sure in working on the death camps, a lot of work has been done with the guards from the camp. There are very strong parallels, parallels between the, the idea of it being a dirty job, that is, people who have worked in slaughterhouses, for example, they have very uh, ungracious jobs with the cleaning, for example, in places. And also the tasks of murdering people. Now, in my opinion, this kind of comparison is very complicated to be able to, to carry to a certain, uh, be able to carry out because what holds up the best is the obvious relationship between the animal slaughterhouses and slaughtering humans. And I think it's very strong in the sense that uh, the same kind of implementation of work uh, can be observed with the dissociation of the uh, labor chain with separate jobs and well segmented with a lot of turnover which is comparable, not identical, but comparable to a slaughterhouse and a death camp. Indeed, I think we can find procedures of the same kind which will have a tendency to try to, to have emerge as much as possible the, the people who carry out this work and uh, separate that from their personal responsibility. And in Maximic, there is a, a, a desire to, uh, to take the responsibility off the people as far as possible and to, and to remove the, uh, the responsibility by, avoid, by having them avoid any kind of decision making. That is a reaction like in a slaughterhouse. Like, like in a death camp, they, to try to, to normalize these jobs as much as possible so that the person who is going to be the killer will never, be, will never find themselves in a situation where they have to make a personal choice. Browning shows, for example, that the second massacre after the first one, which in a city called Josepho, the, the second was where, the, uh, where Commander Trapp uh, made the decision uh, where people could, uh, could remove themselves from the ranks with the second massacre. Uh, they hadn't uh, adopted it yet as a routine uh, for uh, just guide, uh, leading people up to the ditches where, as opposed to shooting them. Uh, but, then to be, uh, they, but then they became even more effective uh, uh, to, 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 by, by lying the victims on the people who had just been killed and so the, these are just some of the atrocious details that go along with it. The reason I'm t mentioning all this is because, uh, as a result, the goal uh, is, in any cases, to try and avoid that people have to make choices. And Browning says, in the second uh, massacre of Gomazi, it was worse again because it was uh, less well prepared in technical terms than the first, and yet, a lot of the killers would, in the end, live better than the, those in the first one because they had, were not faced with the issue of having to choose between obeying or revolt, or rebelling, because they, they were told that you haven't got a choice, you have to kill. And that uh, is somehow, they, they let themselves go more easily toward, uh, toward uh, obeying their officers, as, we all, as almost, every, almost everybody does. We almost always obey that kind of order. And uh, the people who say no are always in the minority. 
And exactly the same thing happened. We can consider that it's a terribly tr sad, but that's in most, in most cases what happens. And technically speaking, uh, from this angle, the issue of evacuating the choice of our decision making is fundamental. And it's on that level, that, that is with job divisions and job separations, we can better compare uh, a slaughterhouse to a death camp. That is the death of animals and humans. My name is Fabrice. I also work for MSF. I was in Darfur in Sudan where mass violence were perpetrated in 2004 and 2005. And I'd like to go back to your introduction. And you said that what is specific to the researcher as opposed to human rights activists, for instance, is to have an interpretation which is intrinsically uh, linked to uh, the uh, facts and data and uh, activists and journalists uh, as well. The culturalist interpretation of Darfur, the conflict that was happening in Western Sudan was mainly driven because of this gut hatred of the so-called Arab population against the African population was uh, the narrative which was uh, reported by activists and journalists. And unlike other mass uh, killing uh, settings, could not be based on the so-called dominating uh, racial hatred because one of the problems of this thesis is that it could not be based on uh, pre-existing racial ideology, racist ideology, which was disseminated by the mass media, etc. So much so that those who supported this assumption were focusing on uh, brutalities and on the threats expressed by those who were attacking villages to try and identify any trace of racism that could uh, explain their behavior. Why was it important for us as uh, humanitarian workers? Uh, why was it that we got interested in this uh, war in Darfur? Was it a genocide? Or was it a, a brutal campaign against uh, the uh, uh, insurrection in the region. This vision, uh, Arabs versus uh, sub-Saharan African people, was very easy to understand, to manipulate, and it was very easy for people who were just arriving there to understand who, uh, how to uh, explain the sides of each party. If, for instance, uh, uh, a soldier at the checkpoint uh, was uh, expressing a, a racist sentence against an African, for instance, but it was uh, not so true when you looked at uh, those displaced people who had fled away from massacres were uh, called to uh, the uh, garnison cities where there was the army which was supposed to protect them against any extermination some Arab rebels had joined the opposition. So this situation uh, of a gap between what we were actually observing and what was uh, reported. And it was difficult for us to understand where we were, what was the actual setting. And uh, we wanted to know whether these all, uh, perpetrators of uh, uh, genocide were doing it because of hatred or conformism. And then came uh, the uh, question of whether it was a genocide or not. And the culturalist approach supported uh, this uh, uh, allegation of a, uh, of a genocide now. It would have meant that what we were doing as humanitarian workers, providing uh, food and medical aid was just a smoke screen, uh, concealing uh, uh, an extermination which was underway. So part of the dominating uh, journalist's uh, report was to be better uh, 
explained. It's just a comment, you know, really to try and 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 explain that uh, the culturalist approach was uh, is not always. Uh, uh, easy to live with, particularly as a humanitarian worker in Darfur in the early uh, years of uh, these de of the uh, first decade of the 2000s. Indeed, uh, this is the type of explanation that uh, is uh, handy. You know, it's convenient. You can apply it to almost any context. It's fairly simple and obvious. So I'm not surprised at all. It is the kind of explanation which is uh, massively disseminated nowadays with this idea that in order to kill someone, you have to have a motive. Otherwise, you wouldn't kill. Therefore, one tries to find the motives of killers, uh, motives which will be racism, hatred, you name it. And of course, it starts to be more complicated when you think uh, that uh, this approach is no longer valid and that some people might kill without having any specific motive. And therefore, you have to find another explanation. Yann Moins, I'm a journalist and I'm a member of MSF's board. One comment about uh, children, soldiers, I interviewed former uh, children uh, soldier in Sierra Leone. I didn't feel that there was any brainwashing. It was rather peer pressure, psychological pressure. Children who had been obliged to kill their own f fathers and mothers, making this more difficult to deal with uh, psychologically. I have two questions. I didn't understand the work of Antoine Rousseau and uh, Becker regarding these knives used during the First World War. I don't think it is comparable to um, the uh, shootings uh, of uh, Jews in Eastern Europe. Uh, because you're talking about uh, victims who didn't have any weapons, uh, nothing to defend themselves, as opposed to the soldiers during the First World War, because there were two sol fi soldiers fighting one another. And I think that six or seven years ago, there was a book published which would analyze the conversation of German soldiers who were recorded, uh, and they were in a prisoner's camp, um, run by the um, uh, run by the British after at the end of the Second World War, and I would like to know if this uh, book had any impact on the work of these two historians you've talked about and their controversy. Uh, it's uh, Harold Welzer's book. Uh, I'll start with the second question. He's a psychologist and uh, he's a German psychologist historian, very interesting book, who uh, opened up against the debate with this particular thing where he said that the prisoners uh, were made prisoners on the Western Front and not on the Soviet front or the Eastern front. Uh, they were made prisoners by the British Army in France. I don't remember where exactly. It was the very end of the war, so it was not as violent as those soldiers who were still on the Eastern Front. How, uh, now, notwithstanding this, it raised a new debate about what was the inner thinking of these German soldiers and what they actually thought and what were their actual beliefs. He didn't draw any conclusion, however. Comment is made off mic, sorry. You never know how, uh, what was, you know, they did edit the recordings. They did some, you know, cuts in all uh, the things that they recorded. But I would tend to say that it put more emphasis on this uh, dispositional type of approach that they had a motive and that they believed in it, that they believed in what they were doing and what they had done, even though it's more complex, even though we, did, we don't know how the recordings were used, etc. But it has helped to better understand one particular thing, and we made quite headways on this in understanding this about uh, the Nazi regime.
there was this idea which is today uh, very strong, which was that uh, the Germans knew a lot about Shoah as opposed to what was said for a long time, that they didn't know about it. It was an open secret. The Germans, many, many Germans knew very early on what was happening in the Eastern Front and the massacres in the ditches, etc., because of letters, because of pictures, uh, which had been made by the Wehrmacht soldiers, etc. So I will not dwell on that. And the other question about the uh, fights between soldiers during the First World War and uh, the uh, victims uh, versus the victims of the uh, mass shootings on the Eastern Front. The purpose here is not to say that the soldiers in the trenches were perpetrating the same atrocities as the Germans who were uh, killing families, the elderly, the children, and the babies in the Soviet Union. You're absolutely right in saying that from this viewpoint, this, these two do not compare. But were Goldhagen and uh, Becker uh, Try and make a uh, where we can try and make a comparison between the two approaches is that they put this emphasis on the face to face, being in front of death and murder uh, between the killer and the victim, with no distance, no physical distance between the two. Uh, without the distance between the artillery and all the soldiers and between the German uh, guy who presses the bottom of the gas chamber. You know, directly perpetrating the act of killing yourself. Uh, one enemy, which is another soldier in the case of the First World War and in the other instance, it's, it's, it's a family of, of people who do not have weapons. So. When you are faced with the murder then, and the killer, then you try and understand what's in the mind of the killer. What are the motives? What are the reasons to act? What is the imagination uh, at work in the imaginary process uh, in the mind of the killer? Comment is made of Michael. Then we would have to delve more into the details what Odouard Rousseau and Baker are saying is that when there was this uh, fight between uh, soldiers face to face is that they had some kind of pleasure in, you know, hating. And Odouard Rousseau insisted pretty much on the fact that uh, if you read his book entitled uh, Combattre in all conflicts and as well as the uh, Americans in Asia, etc. They brought back trophies, bits of bodies, you know, scalps of Japanese soldiers, uh, ears that they had cut and things. You know, this act of, uh, of violence on a, a human body. I have two questions. My first question is that in your introduction, you've talked about a, a, an aseptic uh, killing. So what would be the situational explanation to cruelty? That's the first question. And my second question is, you've talked about responsibility. And this leads me to uh, libre arbitre, or the free thinking. In the culturalist approach, uh, free thinking is applicable. The uh, individual would think uh, based on his or her representation, but and uh, individuals may also be uh, considered as uh, social atoms who don't have all the same representation. So there would be not a contradiction, but a kind of contradiction. And in the situational approach, you would have individuals who are determined, who are under uh, peer pressure, social pressure, so, so no free thinking. And on the other hand, uh, there is a, a contingent world where the genocide is happening in this place at this particular moment in time, etc. And all the events are concomitant and individuals are very different from one another. They have their uh, specific features and then uh, free thinking is, uh, is part of the uh, 
controversy. In your view, which of the true of the two controversies uh, leaves more room to uh, free thinking? Well, none of both are both. The problem, I think, is that uh, these questions are completely contaminated by this uh, free will or free choice. It's as if in our daily lives we were constantly acting uh, based on our free will and our free choice. And I do not think, as a sociologist, that our all our decisions are based on our free will that uh, uh, before going to bed at night, we would have to think like a rodent thinker, weighing a situation and making a decision at the, at the end of the day. That's not the way we make decisions, I think, quite seldom, actually. And uh, these questions, I think I would say not polluted, but, uh, you know, stained by free choice or free will, because we're asking ourselves, did we make a choice, for instance? These are, when you talk about resistance, the French resistance, would I have been a collaborationist with the uh, uh, Vichy regime, or would I have been a resistant? There were a few handful of people. Maybe General de Gaulle one day woke up and said, I will be a resistant, I don't know. But many people were caught in a situation which drove them to become resistant. And this is what Antoine Pro has uh, described. He said, maybe I would have been part of the resistance. No, I would say something nasty, says uh, Nicolas Frero. But he said, I would have been uh, resistant with good sociological reasons for that. Not because I would have made a decision in full consciences, I'm going to be a hero and be a resistant, a resisting against the Vichy regime, but in a very down-to-earth way, just because one of my friends would have said to me, join me and come at home tonight. And uh, I would have discovered that this friend is uh, asking me, uh, to uh, sleep at my place because he wants to be under the radar. He wants to go undercover, uh, no longer use his ID card, uh, no longer lives at home because he feels that he's being monitored. And by doing little things like that, helping one and helping the other, that would have had this label of being a member of the resistance. And maybe one day we'll discover that I am uh, resistant without actually saying what was the exact day and time when I decided to become a resistant. It's not always like this, of course, but it's also the way it happens. And it's also the how we can try and have some uh, hindsight and say, well, there is no 100% of the decisions that are based on free will. Except when you're a philosopher, maybe. It's a philosopher's question uh, where you have the pure and perfect free will. And you're absolutely true when you uh, underline this. Many people will say the situational approach deprives you of your free will, of your free choice, because you'll say people didn't have a choice. They were obeying, you know, they were like, uh, you know, the followers. And say that there were stupid followers, once again, is a, a perspective where all of us would um, act in a conscientious way, uh, make uh, reasonable choices, etc. I don't think that we are acting this way on a day-to-day -day basis. Quite uh, the opposite. I think that we should uh, stay clear of this uh, free choice question. And you were absolutely right when you underscored it. This can be reversely uh, observed. The uh, other approach also uh, leads people to be deprived of their free choice and say, well, they were believers, for instance, like believers in a sect, 
who had lost any free will, any free choice, because they were subject to a, a leader or a guru like Führer, Hitler, you know, pulling the strings and manipulating everybody in Germany, and that everybody had, uh, everybody was impregnated with the Nazi ideology. No free will, no free choice anymore. But it is somewhere in between the two that the reality lies. Where times there are times where we are perfectly conformist, and we would prefer to be uh, submitted to the authority and not take any chance and accept peer pressure, because you don't you. Uh, are concerned about your reputation, like uh, you're a soldier, you're sent on the East Front, and you have to survive in this terrible situation. And if I'm not supported by my peers, what's going to happen to me? Therefore, I will accept little things like, for instance, I'm asked uh, to go for a raid. Not that serious. I'm going to go for a raid. Amongst my fellow soldiers, there are people who are uh, hating people. Some will take advantage of the situation. And they're a uh, Nazi. They're going to shoot at the elderly people who can no longer walk fast. They're going to kill children and babies. But you know, I've kept my dignity because I haven't shot any at anyone. I was just involved in the raid. That's it. But as opposed to my fellow soldiers, I was not a killer. And this is what you constantly hear uh, from these police officers when they uh, were uh, um, persecuted during the trials in, in Germany. So these little, or rather big things, because they knew what was happening to these families. I mean, they were not going for a walk in the park, let's face it. So these little thing is something that already has involved them in a situation where they are already the accomplices of mass murders, and they eventually took part in the killings. And this is the kind of thing that we need to try and better understand. Now, the uh, aseptic nature of this crime is uh, key for those who go for the culturalist approach. Ideology, faith, and uh, motives are set aside because you do not accept to see what is actually happening. This is what Stéphane Audouard Rouzon or Goldhagen uh, says to uh, Browning. You do not describe the violence as it is because you are a man living in a peaceful society. You refrain from describing horrible things because you're afraid that people will qualify your writing as being vulgar, while uh, Goldhagen says you have to be as realistic as possible in describing these crimes if you really want to truly give an account of what were the motives of those people. Because if you have an aseptic vision of things, you will keep a distance with their beliefs and uh, their uh, their motives for acting. While those people had motives for acting, they had motives, motives that are visible in the violence that they are perpetrating. No. If you want to track back from the crime to their beliefs, you have to describe the crime. You have to describe their crime in the most realistic and accurate way possible, because this account of cruelty will help you track back what were the reasons to act and what were the motives of those people. One last question. Uh, my name is Ariane. I am a psychiatrist. I have a comment and then a question. My comment is, that as a psychiatrist in relation of uh, the so-called uh, psychiatrization of uh, violence, which is a problem to me, I just wanted to give an example in relation to this culturalist approach. My problem with this approach is the distance uh, 
this uh, intention to have a distance with the explanation well just to give you an example 80 percent of uh, uh, rapists know their victims so it's a kind of fantasy uh, of having a distance between the the criminals and the victims in these uh, studies and this is harmful and damaging for the research itself and for prevention of crimes because we always uh, tend to forget to look at what we are and all of us have these seeds in us and then my question is about uh, Zimbardo I know that in Google, in there, I had uh, dissidents written in big letters in the lobby hall of their building. I don't know whether Zimbardo's experiment uh, would have helped uh, people to uh, resist more. I would like to know whether this experiment was carried out at a wider scale. I don't know about that. Maybe you know if there was any other such experiment. I think that Zimbardo specialized in this afterwards and has the Stanford experiment has become every a very uh, uh, popular and is reported in all psychological books in France uh, and uh, English-speaking countries, you name it. And at the time of Abu Ghraib uh, scandal, he said Abu Ghraib is uh, the pure um, reflection of what I did describe in my uh, experiment. In a very short while, these uh, American soldiers in a fortnight became um, executioners and torturers uh, suddenly. And he tried and, ex and uh, used this Abu Ghraib terrible scandal by publishing uh, books on how to resist uh, submission to authority, how to resist conformism, etc. I can't tell you much more about it, but I don't think that it resulted in, in many other things afterward. He was invited uh, to many conferences as a lecturer after that. I don't know whether this does have an impact or not. It was not implemented further after. I don't think so. I don't know. So now this is the end of our uh, conference. Now, if you want to delve into that, I will recommend you to uh, read uh, his uh, paper, Faut-il être motivé pour tuer? Should there be a motive for killings? And read his books, uh, Face à la persécution, 1991 uh, Jews in uh, the uh, in the, the book, also The Trenches, Jean Hervé and Marc have also written a book in 2007 on genocide and mass crimes. It's a book about Rwanda. This book is now available on the website of the crash. You can read it online. And for MSFers, you may go to the fifth floor if you want and have a book. And finally, after this conference, you will probably understand that uh, Jean Hervé and Mark Brooks is just a micro history, a situational history of events which happened in Rwanda between 82 and uh, 1994. Rwanda and Zaire. Nicolas Mario, on behalf of uh, MSF uh, Scratch Team, thank you very much. We paid great attention to your uh, statements, and uh, we can now go for a drink. Thank you to all of you. I'd like to add, uh, for those of you who don't want to buy the books, it's better to buy books, you know, but you can also download some articles on these topics uh, free of charge on my website. Uh, they're free of charge.